Hi guys, and welcome back to the final episode of Let's Make a Redstone Computer. In the last episode, we completely finished all the hardware. So today is about software. We're gonna make some cool programs and show off what this computer can do. I hope you enjoy. Before jumping into programming though, let's go over how our assembly language works in detail, because there are some things I haven't mentioned in this series yet. In general, every instruction is written as an opcode followed by the operands. And the order of these arguments is the exact same between assembly and machine code. Now, technically, you can just write decimal numbers for everything. 2, 1, 2, 3 will assemble to add R1, R2, R3. But the better approach is to use symbols. The symbol for opcodes is a three-letter mnemonic, and the symbol for registers is R followed by that number. Then for immediate values, like the 4 in LDI R14, you can write them in decimal, or in binary using the 0B prefix, or in hex using the 0X prefix, as long as the length of the immediate is correct. There are also symbols for the condition codes of a branch. Here are all the ways to write the zero flag false condition, zero flag true, carry flag false, and carry flag true. Remember, these equality based ones only make sense when there's a compare, or a subtraction, directly before the branch. And then there's also some symbols for input and output. If you write a single character from this character set and wrap it in quotes, it'll assemble to its character code. Capitalization doesn't matter because the character set only has one version of A through Z. And if you write the name of any address, 240 to 255, from the name column with underscores between the words, it'll assemble to that address. For example, LDI R1 clear screen buffer will put 246 into register 1. On top of symbols, our assembly language also has labels, definitions, and comments. Labels always have a dot as their first character, and they can be written before the opcode or on their own line. In the case that a label is on its own line, it assembles to the next instruction below. In this program, for example, add them assembles to 2 because the next available instruction, add, has address 2, and then stop still assembles to 3. Definitions are similar to labels, but this time they have to be on their own line and they always follow this syntax. Define, word, number. For example, if you say define myVal4, then myVal will assemble to 4. You can think of it as creating a new symbol. And by the way, definitions don't have to be at the beginning. They can be anywhere in the program. In this program, for example, there's a define right in the middle. This works fine, and you can still use this new symbol anywhere in the program, even above where you defined it. The assembler is smart enough to figure out all the symbols first, and then fill them in. And then comments are just a way to make a note without affecting the actual program. To write a comment, just type a slash, and then the rest of your message. Everything after that slash will be ignored. Now, you don't have to memorize any of what I just said to make a program. All the rules and specifications I just described can be found on the README of the project linked in the description. This README is super useful. I highly recommend reading through it. On top of describing the assembly, it also has the final instruction set spreadsheet, including IO and pseudo instructions, and it shows you how to create and run your own program. To create a program, simply create a new text file, change the extension from .txt to .as, open it in your favorite text editor, and start coding. That's it. Then to run a program, there are two options. The one I recommend is to use the simulator created by Edo. Once you've opened the simulator, you can just drag a program in and press the start button to run it. You can also change the speed, step line by line, and view the memory components as it's running. It's basically a simulator and a debugger in one. The other option is to actually run it on the Minecraft computer. I'll warn you though, the instructions for this are more complicated, and Minecraft is incredibly slow. Even if you speed up the game with tick rate, chances are it just won't be enough. The only real solution to run programs in Minecraft is to use a tool called MCHPRS. This is a custom server that rewrote Redstone to be much faster, allowing you to reach insane speeds. All the information to do this is on the README, but again, I recommend just using the simulator because it's easy. Alright, let's finally make some programs. I'll start super simple and make a Hello World program, a program that just prints Hello World to the display. First, I'll clear the character buffer in case there's anything in it from a previous program. I can do this by loading the address for clear character buffer and storing anything to it. In this case, I'm storing register zero, which always stores zero. Then I'll load the address for write characters, load the character code for H, store it, load the character code for E, store it again, and repeat this for every character in hello world. And finally, I'll push the character buffer so that it shows up on the screen. As you can see from the simulator, running this program writes hello world to the display. And of course it does in Minecraft as well. Now let's do something more interesting. I want to make a program that has a bouncing ball. Specifically, this program has a single pixel on that travels diagonally and bounces off the walls when it hits them. I'll start by assigning four registers to keep track of the ball. 
register 1 and register 2 for the x position and y position, and register 3 and register 4 for the x velocity and y velocity. Now, since this ball can only travel diagonally, these velocities will either be 1 and 1, 1 and negative 1, negative 1 and 1, or negative 1 and negative 1. And for the starting values, let's just make the position 25 and the velocity 1, 1. Then for the actual logic, we need to do something like this. On every frame, check if the ball hit a wall by checking its coordinates and update the velocity as necessary. Then add the velocity to the position, which moves the ball one step forward. And finally, draw the ball. So first to make a loop, I'll just make a label called loop. And then I'll put the instruction jump loop at the end. That way, whatever code we put here will be repeated indefinitely. Now, to check if the ball hit the wall, notice that you can treat x and y separately. Starting with x, if it's 0 or 31, then the ball is either in the leftmost column or the rightmost column. In both cases, the x velocity needs to be flipped, either from 1 to negative 1 or negative 1 to 1. So I'll check if x is 0 by comparing to register 0, and I'll check if it's 31 by putting 31 into register 5 and comparing to register 5. If either of these branches are taken, it'll jump to here, which flips the x velocity using a subtraction. 0 minus 1 becomes negative 1, and 0 minus negative 1 becomes 1. And then for y, it's the same idea. If the y coordinate is 0 or 31, the y velocity needs to be flipped. So again, I'll compare it to 0 and 31, and if either of the branches are taken, it'll flip the y velocity. Then I'll add the velocities to the positions using some add instructions. And finally, we just need to draw the ball. This can be split up into three main steps. Draw the ball on the buffer, push the buffer to the screen, and then clear the buffer for next time. By repeating these three steps, it'll continuously redraw the ball on every frame. And that's it! Running this program gives you a ball that bounces off the walls. And what's kinda cool is that by changing the start position, you can get different patterns. Starting at 1-1 one, one bounces between the two corners, but starting at 4-7 looks like this. Okay, let's turn up the complexity even more and make a paint program. This program will have a cursor that you can move around with the d-pad. Pressing select will toggle drawing mode, which as you can see draws at the cursor, and pressing start will toggle erase mode, which erases at the cursor. I'll start by reserving registers 1 and 2 to keep track of the cursor position, register 3 for the draw mode toggle, and register 4 for the erase mode toggle. These toggles will be 0 if the toggle is off, or 255 if the toggle is on. I'm also going to put in some definitions for the offsets of all the I.O. ports, and use register 15 as the base pointer. These all have the word port added to their names, because I didn't want to make a conflict with the regular name, which as I said earlier, assembles to the direct address. Sorry, kinda confusing. But anyways, for the actual logic, let's do something like this. On every frame, if select is pressed, toggle the draw register. Then if that register is toggled on, draw on the screen at the cursor. And if start is pressed, toggle the erase register. And again, afterwards, if it's toggled on, erase on the screen at the cursor. And then if the d-pad is pressed, update the cursor position. And finally, draw the cursor. Just like before, I'll start off by making a basic loop. Then to see if select is pressed, I'll load the controller input and do a bitwise and with the bit for select. If you haven't seen this before, a bitwise and can be used to selectively keep certain bits. If you take any bit string and do a bitwise and with a second bit string, then the columns with 1 keep the original bits, and the columns with 0 delete them. So by doing a bitwise and with the bit for select, I'm essentially keeping that bit and throwing out everything else. Therefore if it's not 0, I know for sure that select is pressed. So I'll make a branch 0 to skip over this section, that way if it's not 0, it'll hit this toggle. After that, if the toggle is on, I'll make it draw at the cursor, assuming the cursor coordinates are already stored. Then to see if start is pressed, I'll just use the same strategy. Load the controller info, do a bitwise and, and toggle it if it's being pressed. And after that, if the toggle is on, it'll erase at the cursor. Next, we need to update the cursor coordinates according to the d-pad. To do this, I'll load the controller info one more time, and use another bitwise and to keep the last four bits. If left is on, I'll decrement register 1 which remember is the x coordinate. If down is on, I'll decrement register 2, which is the y coordinate. If right is on, I'll increment register 1. And if up is on, I'll increment register 2. And that should update the cursor perfectly. Store it to pixel x and pixel y. The last thing to do is draw the cursor. This will follow the same three steps from earlier. Draw it in the buffer, push the buffer, and clear it from the buffer. 
But the thing is, making a cursor on a screen with just two colors is kind of hard. You can make the cursor an on pixel, but this can be confusing because you can't tell it apart from any other on pixel. So I'm going to do something interesting. I'm going to make the cursor by inverting these four pixels. That way, the cursor is always different from its surroundings. And with this in mind, it turns out that two of these three steps are actually the same thing now. Drawing the cursor and clearing the cursor can both be done with an inversion. So I'm just going to make a giant subroutine to invert those four pixels. And now I can just call it, push the buffer, and call it again. And with that, the paint program is done. That concludes all the programs I'm going to go through. I hope this gave you some insight on how to make your own. If you want to see more, just join my Discord and check out the CPU Programs channel. You'll see things like Calculators, Tetris, Flappy Bird, 2048, Asteroids, Minesweeper, and so much more. And the beautiful thing is, now that you know how the instruction set works, you could theoretically reverse engineer any of these programs. I know I've talked about Tetris a few times in this series, and if you're wondering, it's about 900 instructions long. But anyways, with that, the computer series comes to a close. If you've made it this far, give yourself a gigantic pat on the back. You've seen how every common part of a computer works, and not just from a truth table, but how the actual logic is built. You've seen how to create an instruction set, and how the machine code of an instruction leads to executing it in hardware. And now you've seen how to use an assembly language to make powerful programs. I know I've said this a thousand times, but I really encourage you to go out there and make your own computer. Chances are it'll be fun. And best of all, when you get to your first computer architecture class in school, you'll get to flex on everyone that you've already made one. Thank you again to Capo and Sloime for all your help with the design of this computer. Thank you to Edo for creating the simulator. Thank you to all the miscellaneous help I've received in my Discord. And thank you once again to Brilliant, who graciously sponsored this entire series. If you guys haven't heard of Brilliant by now, I don't know what you're doing. They're the best place to learn engineering online. From building bridges to simulating neural networks, the lessons on Brilliant will have you play with concepts hands-on, making it not only an effective way to learn, but also building your critical thinking and problem-solving skills. Learning a little bit every day can stack up fast over time, so even with just a few minutes a day, Brilliant will help you grow real knowledge. Plus, it's much better than spending that time mindlessly scrolling. Just like how I made assembly programs and ran them on the simulator, the Creative Coding course will show you how to make powerful pseudocode and run it live. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash mapbatwings or scan the QR code on screen. Or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. 